Welcome to Longevity Industries' presentation of the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I'm your host, Dean Phillips. I have with me today Rodney Grover from Instride. He is the VP of Corporate Partnerships. Welcome, Rodney. Thanks, Dean, and thanks for having me. This is uh, this is going to be fun. It's great and informative, to, hopefully. You know? Yeah, that's isn't that great when you can put those two things together? Nice Venn diagram of that. It is it's fantastic. <clears throat> so, right off the bat, what's your big takeaway for five years from now? What's what what changes do you see coming down the road? You know, that's a great question. <clears throat> Excuse me, especially coming off the last two two and a half, you know, two years now in the in the pandemic that we've had. Um, I can just tell you, we're not, we're not going back to pre pandemic working conditions anytime soon. in in any industry, whether you talk manufacturing or even hospitality or, um, or even fast food services, uh, you know, we're not going to go back to prior pandemic working conditions. That's for sure. And, and so with that being said in the manufacturing and industrial market, lots of changes are going to continue in the pace of, uh, this in the industry 4.0 and automation and, and, uh, and I just see with that a, a change in how we manage our people and, you know, which probably most of our topic today that we talk about is how do we manage the talent over the next five years? Because the horizon for this industry is things are coming back. They're being reshored into, into this country to, to build here again, which is good news. But what's not good news is we still have a, not only a labor shortage, but a talent gap that we've been talking about for, for 20 years now. You and I talked about this years and years ago when I first met you, Dean. And so we've got to, we've got to address that. <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree with that. And one of the challenges I believe goes back to, we think that this change is going to happen tomorrow. It isn't a switch we can turn on and say, we're ready now for educating people or we're getting behind changing culture within business. It's, it is a progression and it takes some time to implement that. And it doesn't happen in a way that people think it's going to, in my experience, when I've seen companies that have done an excellent job at, at developing a great culture in their, their workforce, it happens in a very different way. They start out down one path, but then they realize that every person's different. Every department's different. Every application is different. And they have to kind of massage those things to get it to where, Hey, it works for us. I, I've been told yeah. many times, you know, somebody will say, well, so-and-so doesn't use lean or they don't use six Sigma. Well, but they use their form of it. You know, is Toyota exactly what lean is or what somebody might say, or what, uh, somebody might say Electrolux or Whirlpool, they all have their own interpretation of things and it works for them. That's right. That's right. And, and, and so going back to your original question of five years or five year horizon, you know, the, the vision of investing in, in, in the development of talent, uh, w whether it be the, the content that must be learned in, in the pace of work, or the investment in the individual to show that the company wants to have and needs to have a, an emotional connection with them is what I envision happening. I, I envision that the investment in, in folks, and this is you know, the work that I do at Instride on a daily basis, that we do on a daily basis, is making sure that companies understand that when they make an investment in somebody's pathway to prosperity, whether it be to an opportunity in their business or not, those employees then turn around and, and reinvest back in into that business that they're working for. And we, and we see it, we see a three, four, five X return on every dollar spent versus the tactical approach, which is found in most learning and development organizations of, you know, you must press this button here and, and do this movement here and learn this specific programming language. The employees see that as tactical, not a really a true investment in them. And this new generation of employees, especially the ones that we're trying to attract right now into this industry, they want to feel like they're part of something that's bigger than themselves, bigger than this, just the task at hand on their eight hour shift. Right. I, I see that from most of the younger uh, people coming out of the, the 
Tennessee Techs, the MTSUs, the the colleges that are are building our workforce of the future. When you interview or you talk to them, you hear it in their voices that they want to understand where that it isn't. You're not sitting in your cubicle and you're just working on your where where you fit into this. You, they want to see that. They want to understand how they're changing the world. They want to understand what their impact is. And I think it's important to to clarify that for people. Yeah. Well, so, especially in my, you know, in my past in managing plants before you and I even met at, at SME, in my past in managing the plants, my best performers were always those that had this inquisitive nature of, you know, I'm running this machine over here, but the parts that I'm producing go into an, this assembly down the line, I want to go down and learn that process so that I understand when I have this burr or this, this tolerance is off or, or whatever have you in, in, in my area of the work, how it influences my partner downstream who's doing the work downstream. Those were always the employees were, that were my top performers. And it was because at some point in time, whether it was myself or one of my frontline supervisors or somebody in their, in their history of work, taught them a mentality and in, in invested in them to care, to have the mentality that they cared about the work and, and job that they were doing. I think we're good- never going to solve this. Dean, we're never going to solve this. Sorry to interrupt you, but we're never going to solve this skills gap if we can't figure out how to make an emotional connection to the talent that we're hiring. Exactly. Bottom line. I, I agree with that. I think the other thing that uh, is important to convey, is speaking of those those top performers, I believe is an understanding of your ownership of the company. Not that you own the company, but your ownership, take ownership of what your part of this is. You know, whether that's saving a nickel on a on a box of staples or whether it is understanding how that's impactful by hey, you know, with gas prices being what they are, you know, drive to two gas stations and get the lowest one as opposed to, well, I'm here and I I don't care the company pays for it. it, it I think there's a different mentality. That's right. That's exactly right. It's it's interesting because Back in my days of managing plant operations, I, I, I always re, I always resort to the story of a, a, a institutional talent that I had working for me. This guy was a machine operator, had been with the company for 15 or 20 years, was nearing retirement, and I went out, was leaving for the day. His shift had been over for 45 or 50 minutes. I can't remember exactly, but it had been over for some time, and he was out in the parking lot picking up trash. He was out in the parking lot picking up trash when it came. And I was, this was a union environment. So when it, when it came to time for a raise and they were going to get their annual 30 cents or 40 cents in their uh, of income boost, I fought for a dollar 50 for this, this guy because he cared. And I think that that's, I guess the bottom line over the next, you know, over the horizon is this business of, of industrial and manufacturing and production needs to foster and build and then support that type of behavior in order for us to win, in order for us to maintain this, this influx of building things here in in America and building things again in our plants and having the innovation and ingenuity to lead the world, which we always have starts with this human connection. And if we cannot companies that I'm telling you right now, the companies that, that aren't going to, that are, are resistance to this and, and say, Oh, Rodney, this is just fluff. <clears throat> My prediction is they won't be, they'll, they'll be eaten up. I mean, perfect examples that, you know, I'll use, I'll use Amazon right now. They're, they're, they're taking over the world with how they're treating their employees and how will a small to medium sized manufacturer that is two miles down the road from an Amazon distribution plant compete if they're not willing to make that emotional connection which Amazon is investing in, in, in their people. Right. I, I don't know if I can use Amazon or a perfect, you know, example of a company here on your podcast, but you know, it's just the truth. They're, they're hiring people, paying for their education, investing in not only their education, but the education of a dependent and, 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 and they're going to take over all these folks that, that, you know, that manufacturer should, manufacturing should be going after to pull into their facility. Right. So let's circle back to your your background. 
what, how did you get involved in manufacturing and then uh, your time at SME and to where you are now yeah. at Instride? Yeah, it's, it's been a journey. <laughs> so, so it's very interesting because um, I started out as a welder and a machinist working for a family manufacturing business in, in Saginaw, Michigan. My dad was the co-inventor of the first electric wheelchairs that now you see in many of the grocery stores and, you know, the little scooters that folks uh, with, with disabilities um, uh, use. And, and I worked for, for him for all the way through college and got a degree in welding engineering and then went on, chased my wife to Chicago and, and left the family manufacturing business and, and started a, a, a career as a plant manager over in the Chicago area for two mid-market companies. And then became very impassioned about the offshoring initiatives. And this was back in the you know late eighties, early nineties, where where we had CFOs around the country and these large manufacturers saying, "Well, if we can build it cheaper overseas, why would we build it here?" And I don't understand the chip making process. So I became very impassioned in writing articles and and uh, and, and blogging at the t- you know before blogging was cool, blogging at the time and and talking with whoever I could talk to at NAM and other organizations like SME. And that's what really brought me to SME back in, um, in, in the early, uh, early two thousands and had a great career there, uh, worked my way up into the education foundation where we, where I launched and, and built the prime initiative and wrote the business model for an initiative now that influences about 130,000 of our nation's youth into careers in in our profession that we're talking about today. So I'm very proud of that work. And, and then that work led me to SME because, or excuse me, led me to Instride, which is now continuing that education for working adults and really fostering uh, this positive work environment that, uh, you know, that we've talked about so far this morning. It's interesting you, you say that because one of the things that I, I, I always question or, or wonder about how, how do we do that? How do we teach a culture of caring, a culture of ownership? How, how do you, how do you start even with that? <laughs> yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. It starts with a challenge, right? And, and I, I get to, I get the distinct pleasure of on a weekly basis, challenging C-suite leaders from all over the country to think differently about their talent and about the resources that are on their plant floor and how to make that emotional connection. It, 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 again, it goes back to earlier in our conversation. I think that the, in bad business, the, the fish always rots from the head to the tail, not from the tail to the head. Cultures are driven by the C-suite, not from, you know, they're, they're maintained and they're promoted through the layers underneath but it starts with the people leading the business. And so creating a culture of caring starts there. And I get the distinct pleasure and sometimes joy, sometimes disappointment of being able to talk to these folks about what it means. I tell that story about the the man picking up, you know, my employee picking up garbage after, after his shift and, and then how that might resonate across the, an entire business ecosystem and how that might lead to, cost of poor quality reductions and reductions in turnover and more on-time deliveries and, and how that attitude and culture plays a role in all of those key, uh, key performance indicators in a business. And so when you ask the question, how do we get started? It starts with a challenge and people, people asking each other and having crucial conversations about how is your culture? What's your turnover? What's your cost of poor quality? How are you finding and attracting your next generation of talent? What is your applicant yield from somebody that says they want to start at your business? You go through the hiring process and go through the motions of offering them a job, which costs on average now about 10 grand to onboard somebody before they even get started. And then they don't even show up on day one. Well, because they got on glass door and read that you, you stink as a leader. <laughs> right. So, so that's where all this, I think, you know, if that clearly answers the question, it starts at the top, Dean, and there's got to be a recognition that people are important. Do you think that today you have to address the the desire from the, whether it's uh, floor workers or anyone else, a flexibility 
of their schedule? Absolutely. I mean, you think about the working populations in, in across the globe that have just gone through the worst two years. We could have never imagined as a culture going, I couldn't have, you know, I've been on this earth 50 plus years now. I could have never imagined uh, going through what we've gone through in the last two years and, and, and the struggles that we've had in our HR roles, how to manage all of this, especially in the manufacturing environment. And so there has to be this level of flexibility because People were told to stay home for months. We purposely shut down plants and people still survived. They realized, you know, whether it was the government paying them to stay home or not, people realized that there was more to life than having to punch a time clock at seven o'clock and punch out at three thirty. And, you know, like I said in the beginning, the manufacturing industry has been experiencing a skills gap for a couple decades or more now. This last two years have just made it worse. Right. So what are we going to do to be able to attract talent? You have to be flexible as an employer. I know you have to run your machines and you, you, you have to get product out the door, but you've got to, re- you, the, the companies that are succeeding in all this are finding ways to keep their talent engaged, even working mothers by offering up training courses that, while they're at home you know, for part of their work shift, part of their eight hour shift, two hours, they get to go and, and pick up their kids and take some safety courses or take some quality leans, you know, six Sigma quality courses online. The progressive and, and advanced companies that are, succeed, are succeeding in the world that I see on a weekly basis are those that are doing those things. Yeah. I've noticed out there more and more companies adapting to virtual employees and that includes manufacturing. Uh, it's it's interesting because I've heard from several people who said, well, this is where we have our plant and people have to go to that plant. And while that's true to some extent, there are more and more opportunities to, for people to work remotely doing different things. There's companies out there now that have remote-driven fork trucks. So they have an adapter that goes onto your, your fork truck so that it's actually driving remotely. So maybe you only need a fork truck driver for an hour a day to load your trucks at, at three o'clock. Maybe it's that you, you're a very small business and you don't have something to keep them busy with. Okay. In those instances, maybe having somebody drive remotely or you have a robots running some things and some of those robots can be operated remotely by somebody else. So there, I think there's more of those opportunities. And even to spread out your talent pool used to be that in mark, well, in maintenance, you had people that would uh, pass along institutional knowledge. But when you get to a big company, uh, let's say you're a major manufacturer and you have 50 plants across the U.S., well, do I have to train all of them? especially with today's turnover rate, maybe that's not even feasible. But with using things that are augmented reality, putting on a pair of augmented reality glasses, you go out on the machine, and the other person on the other end, which is your only expert for this machinery, rather than fly him out, I can have him look at that equipment and do that. I just think that there are more opportunities now to look at flexible manufacturing and these new types of virtual environments and adapt to those. Do you think that a lot of these new companies have to look at that? Well, I think it's even the, I think it's even the established companies Dean. you know, again, when you and I first met, we, I remember reading articles in manufacturing engineering, engineering magazine and, and touring them on some of the SME events where we were celebrating companies that were running lights out operations. This was 15 years ago way before the pandemic and we were celebrating, Oh, look at, look at how automation is changing and industry 4.0. And as it crept in, you know, five or six years ago into the, into our language in this industry, we were celebrating companies that were adopting these technologies to be, to be more, to be less labor intensive and more automated. And so bottom line is they, even an automated company still needs people, but those automations can be controlled from a remote environment. They can, to your point, the logistics, 
Um, logistics is, is, is the next industry that is, is being completely automated in regards to, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles and autonomous racking systems and, and things like that. So, <clears throat> yeah, they're going to, we're going to have to adapt. And, and that's, what's kind of scary about all of this is we've been, we've been struggling with a skills gap for machine operators and press operators and for laborers and for quality technicians and for engineers for 20 years in, in our culture and in, in the industrial market. Now throw on top of that, the industry 4.0 movement where, where the technology has been outpacing education at a five to one ratio, meaning every year in comparison to the five years of change in education, every year the technology is changing, but yet it's taking five years for education to keep up with that. Now throw on top of the, the pandemic and folks wanting to work from home, there's this, this whole thing and this whole five-year horizon that you asked about at the beginning of this podcast. All of that plays into what we've talked about in, in relation to creating that emotional connection so that people want to work for you, being flexible with them, treating them as human beings, investing in them in their talent and their development long-term creating a culture of scalable, continuous, lifelong learning so that you can implement those technologies so that you can expand your business into new areas that are, you know, that are including automation and uh, automated assembly and lights out CNC operations and those types of things. <clears throat> yeah. There's even my company that I work for my day job, just link systems years ago, we had one of our technicians who was relocating and he's like, well, I'm sorry to leave. And they're, and they had to think about it, but they said, what if we can come up with a way that you can continue to do your job remotely? But that's the kind of out of the box kind of thinking you have to start implementing and you have to start conveying that message to people. Cause if you come in and you're going to take a hard line stand of, no, this is the way it is. You're going to work this to this. Okay. Why? Why, why do you have that perception? If you have good people and let's say, let's say for instance, you work from six till seven 30, then you get your kids off to school. And then at eight 45, you're back doing your job. And then you take a break at three o'clock to pick them up from school. So if, if that's the hindrance, we just need to stop looking at what the problem is and look towards a solution. So right for, for people. Do you, how do we convey that? Again, it goes back to, it goes back to more, more of these opportunities for folks like you and I to influence. And it goes back to folks paying attention to those, um, those thought leadership pieces on LinkedIn that talk about this. I see piece, you know, it, I see folks pushing this and, and creating this agenda similar to what we talked about earlier with lean. If you remember what lean was to this industry 20 years ago, it's, it's, it's the, it's the language of industry right now is this emotional connection to talent through an investment to create that scalable lifelong learning culture in your business. But it's going to take, it's going to take folks like you and I, it's going to take the business leaders and fortune 100 and fortune 500 employers that are, employing tens of thousands of frontline employees. Mary Barra, perfect example with General Motors. She, she is on this push to, she, she's made her goals very clear as a business. We're going to be an electric car company, all, all electric. We're going to go sustainable by 2030. And in order for us to do that, we're going to have to manage our people and our talent differently. I commend her. I commend General Motors for the work that they're doing. Um, and, and because they're going to win because they're looking at this, a leader like her and from the top down, again, the fish rots from the head or the fish gets consumed from the head to the tail. She's taking this from a head on approach to really create a culture. That's going to be a winning culture for that business. So that's where it starts. It starts with leaders taking a stand, standing up and becoming true leaders, not managers, but leaders, you know, to drive that culture. And then, and then by the way, reward those that are helping support that culture at the frontline leadership role, the plant management, the supervisor, the, the folks that really take an interest in those that are working for them. There's a, a video. Uh, it was from a Ted talk and it talks about your early adopters 
and it's it shows this music festival and there's a guy out there dancing all kind of crazy and and he says but then somebody else joins him and he says he says you have to encourage your early adopters it isn't the one crazy guy dancing at the festival it's those <laughs> other crazy ones that get there to make it something a movement yeah. to where everybody starts getting up and dancing it's you have to have those early adopters that are willing to go ahead and say look this is what we're doing to move this forward we have to do it we have to accept this change we need to understand how this is going to impact us in the long run but be flexible you have to be flexible today i, I believe that's one of the most important things you can do is be flexible don't go in with the thought that I put this screw in this bolt. Okay. Think broader. Maybe your fasteners. Let's say let's go just one level up and say you're focused on fasteners. <laughs> it isn't just a quarter 20 bolt. At least think of outside of the box of that that your that that your scope is something bigger. They uh they talk about this a lot in uh, the Japanese companies was you should be thinking of two levels above where you are today. That's exactly right. And, and by the way, Dean, there's a return on this type of investment. <laughs> you know, this is where I have fun. This is where I re really, our organization and what we're doing at Instride, this is where we really make an impact because we're able to showcase to the C So now take all of this, right, and wrap it up and take it to the CFO's desk because I don't care if you're the CEO in a company, you still got to answer to your shareholders and you still got to answer to the CFO on what you're spending. You take this culture that we're talking about of continuous scalable lifelong learning and caring about your people and being flexible and creating this, you know, this movement within your own business. There's a cost to this, right? It, I call it an investment because we're able to showcase there is a return on this. The companies that are doing this, that are implementing this type of cultural strategy, if you will, are seeing a three to five X return. So $3 on every dollar that they spend is coming back to them in the form of less turnover, higher quality, more engaged workers, longevity in their institutional talent, meaning you've got folks that are there for 15 or 20 years that aren't part of this, that don't want to be part of this great resignation that we're going through right now as a, as a culture, you've got things, you've got things like uh, on time delivery, uh, quicker time to technology implementations for new innovations like automation and industry. So think about all of those business KPIs returning a three to five X for a cultural change. And it's not simple. I don't want to make it sound like this is, this is easy. But as if, if leaders are hearing this podcast, there's people that can help you and there's, but it starts with a mindset and a people first mindset and a willingness to look at a people first culture. Agreed. And I think that when you're doing training, you have to have, how do I make this more impactful for them? How do I make people yeah. understand the information? I think, that has to change too. The way that we convey information, the way that we teach, and the way that we instruct our people has to be more adaptive to current things. You know, use VR, use AR, uh, use those tools, use uh, use artificial intelligence to to gain a better insight into what people are doing, how they're doing it. Uh, give you a perfect example of of how people are using AI in the safety environment. We've had people where you can see all the sensors and all the e-stops around a piece of equipment. Well, they came to realize that everybody but one employee was going through one door, but the other guy would do it, and he had a reason for it. He, he came in through a different door. But it's just understanding that that culture and that mentality is there that you just assume and project out to people to, that – Yes, everybody's doing this. Well, you may be wrong about that. And <laughs> and maybe it's just telling them that there's something to be gained by coming in through this door because you can see when you come in through this gate around the safety of a machine, when you are standing there, you can see into the die. 
Now, this person was coming in and doing his role from the back of the machine, and he could not see into the die. Consequently, he had things that were would happen, and then the die would get uh, a scrap kind of into the into the tool. Well, they had a better situation because they were coming in. But if you didn't have that data to help educate you at, in, at the process of that person, because the question is, hey, what, what do you do? What's going on differently? How come this guy's having a problem with the tooling? Well, it wasn't that he was loading the tool wrong. It wasn't that he was doing other things. It was strictly one aspect of his job, but you would not have known that just from if you ask them, they all would say they all do the same thing, but they don't. No, and that's exactly right. So you and I are going to get together someday and write a book. I mean, <laughs> people, you know, maybe, maybe we'll do an extended podcast because, uh, and we're going to call it the, the why behind leading people, right? If people need to, if people, especially now, need to understand the why in the process. So why should I be at the front of that machine instead of the back of the machine? Why is it important that I do this versus that? And, and, and I think poor leadership in many cases treats people with such, um, I don't want to use the word neglect, but they, they treat sometimes their folks like they don't need to know the why. And in that perfect scenario that you just named is the why because somebody could get hurt. You're producing scrap. This is that, again, this is that whole cultural thing that this, this entire conversation has been about. And so thank you for that, that story because it's very pertinent and it's the why behind how psychologically people want to be led and how they want to perform and how they want to contribute as an employee in our industrial space. Rodney, we are just about out of time here. Uh, tell people how they can get in touch with you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Love to make connections on LinkedIn. Um, Non-shameless plug because I'm very proud of the work of Instride, but you can check out our website at instride.com. It's I-N-S-T-R-I-D-E.com. Um, or reach out to me at rodney.grover at instride.com. And I'd love to have a conversation with, with anybody that hears this and would like to learn more. Great. And I thank you, Dean, for your time too, brother. I'm, I miss you. I miss working with you. Same uh, here. I really appreciate it. Same here. Thank you so much.